I invite you today as we explore a challenging topic of sex and sexuality, I invite you to practice some self-awareness. Notice what is rising and falling inside of you. Where are your thoughts going? Where are your emotions going? Where are the places in this talk where you feel Okay, am I getting some feedback? Do I sound okay? Uh, where are places during this talk where you find yourself leaning in and you're a big yes, like that makes so much sense, that resonates with my experience, that helps me feel a bit more affirmed in, in my perspective? And where are the places that you kind of bristle, something that feels challenging? So I invite you to notice what's coming up for you, working on this topic. And um, of course, to meet anything, to meet any of our emotional stirs with some really fierce self-compassion. So if you even need to put a hand on your heart, um, as you just notice that this is a pain point for you, an area of grief, one of the things I'm, I'm blessed to have a team of graduate and undergraduate students who are with me as I do my work. And one of the things that I, I wouldn't have known to anticipate this going into writing Taking Sexy Back but what we found, again and again, as we were doing the research and having the conversations and, and prepping this manuscript, what we found, again and again, was how much grief and sadness we were moving through. And the unfortunate places where we, in our culture, get kind of locked down around the topic of sex. I also invite you, many of you, most of you are here as clinicians. Many of you are potentially here as clinicians parents. Um, I know, I noticed that. What shall I do? Um, so notice the hat that you are wearing as you're sitting here. And if you are sticking mostly with your clinician hat or mostly with your parent hat, I invite you to at least try to also put on the hat that is about you and your connection to your own sexual self, to your own erotic self, to your own emerging, developing, unfolding relationship to sexuality. Then I'll lose my mic. Okay. Okay. So as Emily indicated, I think of the work that I do as existing on the three points of a triangle. I am a therapist, so I see clients at the Family Institute's Northbrook office, and when I am there, I'm mostly working with couples in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. The other corner of the triangle is that I'm a teacher, so I'm training graduate students to do couples therapy, or I'm teaching this undergraduate class, which is starting in just a few weeks. We've got 100 uh, undergraduate, mostly graduating seniors, diverse on every dimension that could be diverse, and a team of 12 teaching assistants, and we're going to move them through 10 weeks of understanding more about who they are and how they love and are loved. Uh, and then the third corner of the triangle is translation. So I translate what we do in our offices, what researchers do in their labs, and I make it applicable for end users. And uh, I really have found such pleasure in writing books that are self-help books. I really like taking what we do and making it applicable for the general public. <clears throat> oh, I need a third hand. <laughs> I'm, also, um, I'm also married to the boy who lived across the hall from me freshman year in the dorm at University of Michigan. <laughs> and we're the parents of two teens, a uh, 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. So what I was saying before about the hat that you're wearing as you sit there, I think in these, com what I have found again and again in these conversations that I've been having about sex and intimacy, one of the places that we are at risk of going is thinking about our kids. And there's a lot, I've already gotten several yesterday um, when I was at the family liaison meeting and then this morning, questions about our kids. And there's a lot of fear around what our kids are being exposed to that is amplified far beyond what we could have even been exposed to as we were growing up. And so I, so I want to invite you to hold both that awareness that there's a lot of concern for the next generation, while also trusting that the work we do around healing and integrating the places where we are holding fear and shame and silence around sexuality, that that work of integrating and healing ourselves 
is a tremendous gift that we can give the next generation because then we can have a conversation that has no easy answers. We have not been a species of humans that has had 24 seven access to free streaming pornography. We just haven't, this is a brave new world. And so we cannot provide hard and fast right or wrong answers, but the more we can sit calmly and leading with love, which we are able to lead with love when we kind of um, quiet and move through the, the shame and the fear that we may be carrying, the more we can do that, the more we can hold space that is with love and just have conversations. One of my favorite things that has happened so far with this, uh, with this book is back in the fall, we had sort of the pre-copies of the book available and I had a brand new team of graduate students that I was getting up to speed and so everybody, all my graduate students went home for Thanksgiving with a copy of Taking Sexy Back. And one of the gals was sitting on the couch at her home reading the book and her mom walked by. She's my grad student's maybe 24, 25. And her mom walked by and she's like, what the heck are you reading, Taking Sexy Back? And she said, gave her the story. And her mom said, scooch over. And they read the book together. That's beautiful. Those kinds of conversations where we as parents don't have to act like we have all the answers, where we can blush, where we can stammer, but we say to our kids, I'm with you. We, she's 25, she doesn't need you know, the talk. But just that, that what it opened up between them were conversations they hadn't had before in their relationship. Okay, so when I am, whether I am in my therapy office or in my classroom, what I'm always inviting us into is deeper and deeper relational self-awareness. So I define relational self-awareness as an ongoing, curious and compassionate relationship with ourselves that becomes the foundation for intimacy. Especially when we think of a, a couple system, a couple, it's very easy to get focused on the other guy. I've been married for nearly 22 years and I can stand up here and tell you the, all the ways in which Todd Solomon is a challenging husband. I can give you an alphabetical list. We can go chronological if you prefer that. That's easy, right? And you know, those of you who work with couples, when a couple comes in for session one, the thinking bubble above each of their heads is, oh, thank goodness we're finally here in this office. This therapist and I are finally gonna help my partner understand the ways in which they just are so close to the person they could be. And then the other person's had the very same thinking bubble, right? So glad we're here. Now finally, I'm gonna be understood. That's the nature of the thing. That's the nature of creating a couple system is it's really easy to focus on the other person. Relational self-awareness is a shift in perspective towards looking again and again about our own reactivity and the ways in which when we love somebody else, we are pointed back again and again to what's unhealed in us, to the belief that's being challenged, to the expectation that's being unmet, and it's an invitation rather than complaining to get in touch with what's unmet. Why am I so challenged by my partner's behavior? What is the piece of my story? What is the gendered belief that is shaping my reactivity to my partner? <clears throat> We know we're practicing relational self-awareness when we're doing the thing that all of the branches of couples therapy want us to do. You know that whether, whether if you've been trained as a couple therapist, whether you've been trained in emotion-focused therapy or integrative behavior couples therapy or integrative systemic couples therapy from the Family Institute, you know that your work as that couples therapist is to help the couple move from the myopic lens of my partner is screwing this up, or I'm screwing this up, to something that is systemic. It's the dance, it's the cycle, it's the pattern. The more I do this, the more they do this. The more they do this, the more I do this. And round and round we go. And the dance becomes the thing we're working on, rather than fixing me or fixing you. We know we're practicing relational self-awareness when we're holding that kind of thick narrative, right? The dance is getting us in trouble. Here we go again. We're doing that thing that we struggle so much with. We know we're practicing relational self-awareness when that's our language. We know we're slipping out of a relationally self-aware frame when the language sounds like shame. Uh, so our golden equation of love is your stuff plus my stuff equals our stuff. The our stuff is the dance. 
So when shame is present, we're not holding on to the your stuff. The equation becomes my stuff equals our stuff. This relationship is screwed up because of my trauma history, my history of growing up in a family that struggled with addiction. My short fuse is ruining this relationship. That's shame. We know when shame takes the lead, we can't, we, we can't be intimate, right? Shame walls us off. We also know we're not practicing relational self-awareness when blame is present, when we're finger pointing. If you would only, any sentence that begins, if you would just, if you could just, or a sentence that begins with, you make me so. You make me so mad, you make me so crazy. That's blame. We're saying that your stuff is our stuff. This relationship would be just fine, but for your challenging behavior. So that's what, uh, that's what relational self-awareness is about. Coming out of writing Loving Bravely, I was aware that I had more to say about the topic of sex because everything that happens in every domain of our relationship, the volume is up to 100 when it comes to sexual intimacy because there's a nakedness physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically that just make the, makes the stakes so much higher and very few of us go into intimate partnership or into the bedroom having a deep, grounded, wholehearted um, preparation, right? Sex education, one of the things that, that I learned in researching this book is sex education in our country is to my, I doesn't say to my opinion, but according to all of the data as well, it's quite off track, right? It's quite, it's quite problematic. We aren't supporting young people entering adolescence and young adulthood with a really grounded sense of what sex is about. I've spent um, you know, the better part of two decades in this Teaching with Marriage 101 course and what I have refined over time is a way of standing in front of 100 undergraduates who are, as I said before, diverse as they come. So I will have a student who is polyamorous and deeply, deeply can talk in a nuanced way about consensual monogamy and boundary management and how they pull off that kind of relational complexity. Sitting right next to somebody who's never held anybody's hand. Sitting right next to somebody who's religiously conservative. Sitting right next to somebody who, you know, what has, is engaged to be married. So I've had to develop a way of talking about sex that, that certainly bypasses rules, do's and don'ts, yeses and nos, goods and bads, because first of all, who the hell am I to say? And second of all, it, I need to meet them where they are. And so sexual self-awareness becomes my anchor. Sexual self-awareness is providing my students or my clients with tools for understanding the primary essential relationship, which is the relationship between me and my erotic self, between you and your erotic self. That's the primary relationship. From that place of your connection to your sexuality, from that grounded, aware, curious, compassionate place, choices that are aligned arise. This is not how we, we tend to do sex ed as a list of do's and don'ts, and there's certainly, I would never, ever go on record as saying we shouldn't have some element of that, right? We need, obviously people need information about preventing, unwant, preventing STIs, preventing unintended pregnancies, preventing sexual violence, obviously, obviously that is base, basic, foundational. But, we, but what's oftentimes missing is that experience that our sexuality is an essential part of who we are as a person. It is something that lives within us. So I will come out of a lecture. So this is where this is the place from which I begin my lectures. And I will have last year a male student walked up to me and he said, I have I realized in the middle of your lecture, I've never ever heard a grown-up, because I'm still a grown-up, even though they're also grown-ups. It takes a while to feel like a grown-up. I get that. I've never heard a grown-up talk about sex without talking about disease and sin and danger and risk. That makes, I can, that makes total sense. I see how that happens, right? <clears throat> Starting off with this idea that our sexual self lives inside of us, is located inside of us, it is an unfolding story, starts us off in a different place. Now when we collect a client's sexual history, 
it's less about who did you do what with at what age, and more about the story. Tell me the story of this part of you. What were the initial questions this part of you had? Who were you able to ask? What were the answers you got? What did your early experiences teach you? What do you wish you had known earlier? Sometimes when I'm doing a workshop, we'll, um, we won't have time to do a pair and share today, but something really helpful, maybe on your way out of here, turn to somebody and share a memory from your sex education. It could be your formal sex education through your school or your religious institution, or your informal sex education through your family or your friend group. What, what were those early messages? What were the early conversations? And what was the lingering impact? I would not make the case that at, you know, in your 40s, you go to bed with your partner and front of mind are the messages that your seventh grade gym teacher told you. But I would make the case that those are the early imprints, right? Those are the early foundational kind of imprintings. Many of us had sexual education that began by being shown. Sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's like they'll take a, um, like a cookie and sort of everybody rubs the cookie on the bottom of their shoe. And then you sort of are like, would you want to eat this cookie? And the message is around, it's a purity message, right? Around keeping yourself pure. So right there, I mean, we laugh, but when it comes up in a workshop, like I'm just like, let's all collectively like send love to the 15-year-old that you were when that was the exercise that you had happen in your classroom. Because there's such shame in that, right? This idea you have two choices. You can be clean and therefore worthy, or you can be dirty and therefore unworthy. So that's that initial paradigm. And many of us spend the ensuing decades shedding that, working to transform that, heal that. <clears throat> okay, so where did we learn about sex? It could also be a journaling exercise. It could be a conversation with a partner. I think this is really one of the things that stands out in the research is how many of us in established relationships struggle to talk to our intimate partner, the person we are having sex with, we are making love to, about the love we're making. This makes total sense, right? It makes total sense. By what means would we learn how to have a heartfelt conversation about sex when the paradigm around sex tends to get locked into one of two shores? Taboo, you don't talk about it, or titillation, sex to sell something, or sex as a performance. We can't have an intimate conversation in which I hold space to understand your journey and then you hold space to understand my journey, that conversation can't happen when the guiding principles are either that sex is shame-loaded and we can't talk about it, or sex is a performance and we gotta do it right, or something's very wrong with one of us. Neither of those sorts of predominant cultural narratives sets us up to talk well about sex with our partners. So it makes sense. It makes sense that for all of us, that process of taking sexy back is essential. So that's what we did in the book is we took sexy as an adjective. We, the book is, is mostly focused on the experience of what it is to have been raised and socialized in the feminine because research shows that around sex, dating, intimacy, gender role expectations, gender role stereotypes, gender role conditioning is most rigid and pronounced around the topics of sex and dating and intimacy. So, so I needed to choose, I needed to choose a side and write a book about the experience of the masculine or the experience of the feminine, and I, I chose the ladies. So the book is written about the experience of what happens when the messages you have received, the outside in messages you've received, center on what we do around women and sexuality. What's the impact of that? So we take sexy, which is a word a rather fraught word, it tends to be a word that a woman um, doesn't feel entitled to define for herself. It is a question asked in the gaze of another, right? Sexy is sort of out here, do you find me sexy? Versus sexual is, is, is one's own connection to the erotic. Sexual is feeling entitled and worthy and connected to one's own erotic self. So we take that word sexy and we make it into a noun in the book. So the book is about the relationship between you 
and you're sexy. Your sexy is your sexual self. And the book is about getting to know that part of you, that unfolding, dynamic, embodied part of you. <clears throat> And that as we shift from an outside-in experience, the outside-in experience are all the messages that family has told you about what good girls do and what bad girls do and what school has told you, what pornography has shown you, and shifting, sort of quieting that noise and beginning to cultivate from the inside out something that is more grounded, authentic, and integrated. And from that's the place from which great sex comes. I can't, one can't give something that doesn't belong to them. Right? I can't share with, I use the I a lot, not wanting anyone in here to be thinking about my particular sexuality. It just ends up being an easier pronoun in this conversation. I can't give something that doesn't belong to me. Right? And I think that is the experience again and again with girls and women in our culture is that it doesn't belong to me. If it doesn't belong to me, I cannot give it and share it and co-create with it. I had the opportunity on Monday night to go sit in on a, a meeting of a local men's group on campus. They're called MARS, and they are the campus group that is in charge of going into all the fraternities and athletic teams and providing sexual violence prevention training. And I, I can't, I'm just like getting chills. I think it was such a beautiful, beautiful evening to hear about the work they're doing, how they came to this work, what they want from this work. And they're t talking about consent, obviously. Consent is a big issue on campus. But they are helping men on campus reframe consent as being something that you just have to get from somebody in order to keep going to a metaphor that the metaphor that they use is thinking about a jazz band and improvisation. And when you're going to jam and have a jam session, create some improv music together. It's collaborative. It's what are you up for? What's the beat that you want to hold? What's the process you want to go through? What works for you? What am I interested in? It's far, far from the no means no, right? Which is basic bottom preventing a crime to something that is really rich and nuanced and collaborative. And so what I want all of us to be mindful of is what needs to happen in order to help people enter that space. That, that sex, whether it's non-relational sex, relationship sex, married sex, to be the kind of experience that's the two of us figuring out together what constitutes a fun, enriching, escapee, playful, joyful, healing, uplifting experience. Maybe not all of those adjectives every time, but some of them each time. <laughs> a little sort of asterisk around all of this is when I use the word sex, I'm using it as a big umbrella. With my college students, I say it's a big umbrella of licky, touchy stuff. <laughs> it's an umbrella of erotically charged behaviors. What we have done in our culture is interesting, that we have defined sex as penetrative sex. That tends to be the definition of sex. When we use the word sex, the place that we go is thinking of penetrative sex, which first of all, writes off all the experiences of our LGBTQ folks. And it also reinforces subtly, or maybe not so subtly, it reinforces the idea that penetrative sex is the most sex we can have. In fact, that's what we learned on the playground when we learned about first base and second base and third base and home run. That home run was always held up as somehow the prize, the most thing. As we see in a moment, it's interesting how it subtly reinforces gender inequality in the bedroom because that particular act when it takes, when penetrative sex, heterosexual penetrative sex tends to be, the research shows, the least orgasm producing behavior for a woman to engage in. So how interesting that what we have held up as the most sex is also the thing that is least likely to, to result in her orgasm. <clears throat> um, so this is the map of sexual self-awareness. One of the most fun things with this book was, um, was hiring an artist. I've never commissioned art. And uh, we commissioned some art for this book. I had made, this had been a diagram I've used in many, many, many lectures, and I'd always used PowerPoint, you know, just a PowerPoint sort of smart art little chart. And somebody on my team was like, this book deserves something prettier than that. We need something lovelier. 
And so we, this, is what, this is what our artist created. For those of you who practice therapy from an integrative lens, this will look familiar. This is all of my, I know no other way of being a therapist besides what I've learned and taught at the Family Institute. In the Family Institute, we are all about an integrative approach. And the idea is that we, we turn, we land in a domain, and we sort of look and see, is there constraint here, or is there flow here? Is there problem, or is there ease? And so what we do with the map of the, the bulk of the Taking Sexy Back book is it's a journey that the reader and their sexy take to these seven destinations. And in each of those destinations, we're gathering some information, we're reviewing the research, we're looking at some examples, and then we're inquiring within ourselves, what's the degree to which I have ease versus constraint in this particular domain? And that's how we'll spend the rest of our lecture today, is introducing you to these seven domains. And we may have constraint in every single one of these areas, and we may have flow in all these areas, and we may have a mix of all of it. What what I really want to normalize is that most likely we all need some continued sex education. We also, to have, to normalize a lifelong learner approach to sex, I think is really important. This idea that we all need to keep expanding our knowledge base. In part, um, it's because we live at this time, this book um, arose, at a time, I think, in our culture that is so full of both pain and possibility. So I started working on the book in the summer of 2017, and it was just as we were approaching that fateful day in October when Alyssa Milano sent out the hashtag MeToo, right? October 17th, 2017. Alyssa Milano sent out hashtag MeToo. It was not her hashtag, Tarana Burke had originally been using it in the early 2000s, but Alyssa Milano caught that crest of the wave, sent the hashtag out, and within 24 hours, there were a million retweets. That's the right word, right? Retweet of that hashtag. <clears throat> and what that did is it brought forth all of the pain. So we know that around sex, there is tremendous pain. One in three women and one in six men are survivors of some kind of sexual violence. Women have pretty much closed the gender gap around infidelity. Infidelity remains a challenging problem, and it's oftentimes a reflection of skill, information, conversational deficits around sex. Research shows that most of emerging adults report that they wish they had had more conversations in their schools and in their families about loving and being loved. Less than 5% of LGBT youth in their health education classes. Less than 5% see representations of LGBT sexualities that are in a positive light. That's basically brand new data. So it's a time of pain in that we are bringing forth and highlighting and so aware of these problems, but it's also a time of possibility because what happens if and as survivors of trauma don't, um, as survivors of trauma are able to tell their stories Right? That which is named can be healed. If we and as we are willing to make space for the pain that surrounds sex, we make space for the healing. Right? We can't get to the healing unless we are, start by naming what's painful. We also couldn't have arrived at this moment without the last 20 years of research around female sexuality which has been an explosion of, of research on female sexuality. Historically, the story has been the female orgasm. Ugh, it's so elusive. Who can really, who can really understand this, this thing called the female orgasm? It turns out when you ask women, they can explain it to you <laughs> in lots of detail. So we have research now where, where researchers have sat with women and interviewed women and asked about what are all of the ways, the, the kinds of touch the ways in which you follow sensation in your body, you and your partner cultivate sensation in your body that leads to orgasm. Tell us more about that. We can't get answers to questions that we don't ask, and for a long, long time, we did not ask questions about female pleasure. We didn't have information about female pleasure. The female species has had a clitoris for many, many thousands of years, and it was simply thought of as a little button on the outside of her body, 
<clears throat> and it wasn't um, looked at more deeply. It was, some refer to it as the devil's doorknob, which I think is kind of, kind of fabulous <laughs> in kind of a subversive way. But it is also, um, it's, 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 it is fascinating, troubling, infuriating, that nobody, in, nobody asked the question, what is the full structure of this? Until 1998, think of where you were in 1998. The first female urologist in Australia, Dr. Helen O'Connell, was like, I think we should take a look. It turns out it's a four inch long structure that extends into a woman's labia toward her pubic bone. It is rich with erectile tissue and it is far more than meets the eye. So we couldn't have had this conversation in 1995. We didn't have the information. We hadn't asked the questions. So that's a really important point of reflection is why? What is the fear if we start to unpack and explore and understand female sexuality? One of the things is that it confronts the story that women are less sexual than men. And that's a story that keeps the order of things the way that the order of things has been. And if we, what, what happens if we were to find out more about women's erotic energy, erotic potential, capacity for pleasure? It's a time of possibility. I think the possibilities are beautiful. I think there are a lot of partners of women, regardless of their gender, who are like, bring it forth. Like, bring, like let's go. Like, the, I will definitely hold space for the celebration and expansion of your experience of your erotic self. But that confronts a story that many of us have carried for a very, very long time, that sex is a duty, especially if sex in a marriage is a duty, and not much more than that. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so we're gonna go through these domains. I'm gonna um, attend to some more deeply than others, but you will have a, a full book to dive into. The first domain is cultural. So cultural is looking at, inviting the reader to look at the messages that she's internalized about who she needs to be as, um, as a girl, as a woman around sex, and what's the impact of those messages. What we tend to find, the easiest way to talk about this I have found is to go back to an old school concept that I learned in probably my first year of graduate school about agency and communion. Do you guys remember this agency and communion? It was like some, some researcher's idea in the 60s. And what they found was when you, they made measures of, so agency, agency and communion are just two different ways of being in the world. When we are in a space of agency, we're getting stuff done. We're performing, we're achieving, we're striving, we're accomplishing, we're leading. That's the energy of agency, acting on the world. When we're in the energy of communion, we are nurturing, caretaking, tending, ensuring that others are okay. There are two ways of being in the world. But when researchers assessed, they were like, so interesting, men are higher in agency and women are higher in communion. What a weird thing, men and women are so very different. Wow, wild. Without without looking at, um, being thoughtful about ways in which that is what it is to be a good man, a successful man, is to strive, to achieve, to perform, to lead. And what it is to be a good woman is to make sure that everybody else is okay, to tend to others, to provide care, to think of others before you think of yourself. So those are the ways in which the roles we have gotten bound into. And it becomes problematic when we bring that social conditioning into the bedroom, especially if we're heterosexual. So there are ways in which by living outside of the predominant sexual narrative to live out, to exit heterosexuality, to live outside of heterosexuality is to not be able to recreate this so neatly in the bedroom. But when a man and a woman go to bed together, it's really easy to bring this socialization into the bedroom. And it's what we see around men feeling heavy pressure to perform, to provide an orgasm, to get and keep an erection. The entire, when we think about the heterosexual sexual script, it really rests on his ability to get and keep an orgasm. The whole thing kind of goes goes sideways if, that's, if that isn't the sort of compass north, the north star, if you will. 
in a way that's problematic and, and, and limiting um, for, both, for both him and for the partner that he's with, but that sense of agency. I had an undergraduate guy on my research team at one point, and he did a little men's group and was like, what, do you, what would you guys want to have in this, in this book? Like, what do you want to know about women and women's sexuality? And basically the thing he came away with from that conversation is a terror in men to be confused, to not know, to have questions, that that felt not okay. That to not know, it's sort of like the old stereotype of men don't ask for directions, right? That's sort of like a silly stereotype. But if, that's, but if that stereotype is about ways in which we collectively, we've all participated in this, we collectively have made it unsafe for men to be confused. We have equated confusion and following instead of leading. We've equated those things with not being particularly manly. Somehow it's a, it's a betrayal or it's an uh, inadequate performance of the prescribed role. Well, that sets up a real problem in the bedroom, right? If, if he doesn't feel able to ask questions, to be led, to get more information, um, it's, he's not going to be able to, to hold on to a space of communion. Great sex rests on everybody being able to access both agency and communion. Yeah, where we can be grounded in ourselves, able to ask for what we need, while also being connected to the person we're with and taking care of them and being attuned to them. So great sex is sort of like these two conversations at once. I'm connected to myself and I'm connected to you. We see how this gender role socialization really blocks that, really limits that. Because even if he were to ask, what would feel good for you? Okay, now we have her entire, we're going to stay with the heterosexual example. What he then confronts is her entire socialization, which is, oh my gosh, um, I'm not supposed to be thinking about me. I'm supposed to be thinking about you. And I'm, not, I'm, I've been actually working my whole life to maintain and control a variety of appetites. Right? I'm not supposed to want too much of any particular thing. Because then, you know, whatever, if I'm too much, there's a fear, I think oftentimes women carry, of being too much, of being too needy, being too greedy. So to even be asked the question, what do you want, can be quite confronting for a woman, who then in a moment we'll see, may also not have the information she needs about her own physiology, about her parts, and how her parts work, and what her parts like. So both partners are set up to really get quite off track, and then not be able to have the conversation that might help us find our way back. You with me so far? I so want to do a check-in. Talking for an hour straight is painful. I want to hear how you're doing. <laughs> I'm reminding myself we have a whole half hour for that. OK. So moving on to developmental. This is the idea, again, that, that the story of our sexuality is an unfolding story. Who you, even if you had the best sex education in the world, everything that we want, it was inclusive, it was representative, it was pleasure-based, it deconstructed gender socialization stereotypes. I mean, if it had everything we wanted, it wouldn't matter. You would still need to rework your relationship with your sexuality after marriage, after a baby, after an illness, after menopause, after, right? Because it is unfolding and challenging and changing. So whatever we figure out has to get refigured out and refigured out and refigured out. What's complicated about this in a marriage is there's three sexualities, right? There's mine, there's yours, and there's ours. And none of those are static. So it is a constantly shifting, changing picture of how I'm feeling in my skin, how you're feeling in your skin, what I'm available for, what you're available for, constantly shifting and changing making it, I think, wholly impossible that a couple is going to get through a long-term relationship without hitting sexual bumps in the road. There's going to be sexual bumps in the road. And the way through is sexual self-awareness, right? But we can see easily how the distance grows and grows and grows if shame or blame is filling in that space. So around development, the key takeaway here is that is that historically, we have, so, so around development, what we're working on is sort of the why. Why are you having sex? What is driving you? What is, what is your sexual desire about? What's the nature of your sexual desire? Historically, we have thought about sex, early sex researchers think Masters and Johnson and Kinsey thought of sex as a biological drive. 
So sexual desire was thought about as a biological drive. It's an urge. It is horniness. That's what sexual desire is. And sex starts with desire, goes to arousal, orgasm, more orgasms for the lucky ones, and then resolution. And that was the model that was used for a long, long time. And then we found out that, ha not we, I was not there for any of this. <laughs> we found out that about half of the population doesn't start there with desire. When they tell their stories, it's like, I, my partner wanted to and I was okay with it. I was, I was, I felt connected and so therefore, I, you know, we went for it. Um, I felt, you know, pretty low stress level and so we started and then my arousal kicked in. And so for a long time, those people were pathologized. These tended to be women people in long-term relationships with male people. And for a long time, they were pathologized because they didn't fit the script. If this is the script, to deviate from the script is to be pathological, right? And we now are luckily, but only in the last 10 to 20 years, talking about sex in a more nuanced way, like a car. So this is the dual control model. The idea that our sexual desire is guided by an accelerator and a brake. The accelerator are the things that spark us, that inspire us, that lead us to from meh to yeah. <laughs> the accelerator, what brings our walls down, what motivates us, what drives us, what connects us. And our brake are the things that bring our wall up, that make us not want to be intimate. And, and that live, that system, that dual control model lives within each of us. And maybe two partners have the exact same list of contextual variables that spark the accelerator and contextual variables that fire the brake. But most likely there are lots of differences. So what a beautiful intimate practice to get to know our own accelerator and brake, invite our partner to get to know their accelerator and brake, and then talk and learn from each other. In a study done with couples who'd been together for over a decade, couples could only, researchers are talking to partner one and partner two separately, partners could only name about 60% of what their partner liked and only about 20% of what their partner didn't like. And this was in marriage relationships that had been over a decade long. Again, I. I completely get how we end up there, right? We all get how we end up there. We don't have, we aren't, we aren't taught how to talk about sex. But this is a lovely way to start, and it's neutral. There's no blame, there's no shame, it's just these are the things that I know are helpful. You doing the dishes helps. Me having, uh, you know, having worked out that day helps. When there's a bit of ease and flow between us helps. When I listen, there's, I just, um, we created a resource guide in the book, and um, I don't have an anti-pornography stance, but I do have a stance in which I want us to be supporting ethical, conscious, thoughtful erotica, and so there's a, a list of resources around that, um, which can be helpful and supportive. If that's part of what helps the accelerator, um, I want people to be able to access those resources that are nourishing and inspiring um, and supportive. And there's one that's an, uh, an audio app called Dipsia. So it, um, that may be something. So whatever, so it's, it, it, there, there becomes then a neutrality if we're focusing on what inspires me, what helps me, the things that live within me, the things that live in the space between us. And now it's how we invite our partners in, it's, it's how we invite intimacy, deeper intimacy. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, physical. So here it's about our relationship with our bodies. And one piece of it is about body image. Uh, and I know that whether you, no matter how you've been socialized, there are there can be lingering, ongoing challenges around feeling comfortable in our skin. I think there's a way in which to be socialized feminine is to be presented with the idea that your body is always a problem. Right? As my colleague at Northwestern, Renee Englund, says, entire industries, entire economies would collapse if women started to feel comfortable in their own skin. <laughs> entire economies are built on the idea that we're great. We're great. We just could use a little more here and a little less here and a little more. 
And so, and those tapes are oftentimes playing in our head in such a way that we don't even know they're playing. They become the condition of just being awake and alive. And so those tapes are going to come into the bedroom with us. And sometimes we imagine that our partner feels the same way about our body that we feel about our body. And there's a difference between feeling like rah-rah about our bodies and feeling worthy of the skin we're in, right? We can feel a sense of reclamation and worthiness that is a different, it's a different variable than like feeling like, yeah, I'm hot, I'm, whatever that would be, like sort of pro, we don't, we don't need to be pro body or feeling really positive about, about our body necessarily to feel worthy, to feel at home in our skin, to feel worthy of connection and touch and pleasure. Those are different things. Because often what happens is it's like, once I lose X more pounds or tone this up, then my sexual desire will come back. And it doesn't, I mean, we know it doesn't work that way because now there's just another variable or we were working on solving the wrong problem. When the deeper problem is, can we just feel worthy and at home in the skin we're in as we are? And what are the practices that help with that? The other piece that we work on in this part of the book is just naming our parts. So a research, researcher surveyed college men and college women and found that when they were shown this diagram, heads up, we're getting to some stuff here. When shown this diagram, only 50% of women, college women, could name 80% of the parts here, and only a quarter of college age men could. This is not what we're showing. Usually, think about the diagrams you would have seen in sex education. Was it this one? It was the reproductive one, right? You saw the intern, which is definitely there and important to know and understand. Interesting sub, you know, pairing of women's bodies and reproduction. We're here, what we're going towards is, is women's bodies and pleasure, right? If we're naming the clitoris, we're talking about pleasure. The clitoris has one job on earth, which is pleasure. <clears throat> what I was talking about before, how we hadn't diagrammed the full clitoris. This is the full clitoris. I hope that you, this is not, I think when I show this um, and ask for a show, I won't do a show of hands today, but when I ask for a show of hands of who's seen this, um, most of the people haven't seen this. This is not yet woven into sex education curricula. If you, if, if you know that your kids or you are teaching sex ed and this is part of your curricula, come tell me after. I want to, I was going to say I want to shake your hand, but I don't. I want to bump your elbow. <laughs> she can't advocate for her pleasure in the bedroom if she doesn't know how her body works. We were talking before about, um, about ways in, about what the research shows around penetrative sex being the least orgasm producing sexual behavior. It makes sense when you look at the structure of the clitoris and the location of the clitoris. The things that are far more likely to produce an orgasm in a woman are oral sex and manual sex or using, um, using a toy of some kind. Those are the kinds of things that tend to be more orgasm promoting. Not that orgasm is everything, right? We could have a really wonderful sexual experience in which we feel pleasure without having an orgasm. And an orgasm is a muscle contraction, so there can be an orgasm without the experience of pleasure, right? There's the, the arrow goes in both directions. But if what we want to support is, is kind of the, the ability and interest and internal motivation, that accelerator, I'd like to support us having experiences that we feel like relatively reliably are going to result in an orgasm because that becomes a sort of, um, keeps the engine going, right? If I know the experience I'm gonna go into is gonna feel really good, it may be one of the ways that I motivate myself that's going to feel good. All kinds of research around the benefits of orgasm too, right? Reduces headaches, helps with sleep, reduces PMS symptoms. So uh, the more questions you ask, the more interesting answers you get. Okay. Oh, I didn't. Sophia Wallace is a feminist artist who did a whole exhibit on the clitoris. She found this information out and she was like, oh no, we are making art now. We have to create art and celebrate this. And so this is her tagline. The clitoris is not a button, it's an iceberg. <laughs> Which I love because the glands is the part that you can see 
from the outside, but there's the rest of the structure. That's the, there's the iceberg, if you will. Okay. So this slide just shows basically everything we've been talking about so far. It becomes understandable then that we currently have a significant orgasm gap. It's not, it, it sounds like it's an orgasm gap between men and women, but it's not. It's between straight men and, and it's between straight women and everybody else. Women with women rely, the question, the question asked here is how likely are you to have, how, what's the question? I usually or always achieve orgasm. Women with women, 86%. Men with men, 89%. Straight men, 95%. Straight women, 65%. Zero, zero, zero shade against straight men because everything I've been saying is that straight men are set up to not, like there's, it's a massive collusion that hurts all of us. And we see, given everything I've said, how this becomes the case. So for mental, I'm gonna just do this one very quickly, which is um, Dr. Lori Brado wrote the foreword to Taking Sexy Back. And she is one of the preeminent sexuality researchers, women's sexuality researchers um, based in um, British Columbia. And what she found, when she found this number where almost 40% of women struggle with a significant sexual difficulty, she was like, hell no, we're going to do better than this. And what she, the, play, the direction that she went was around mindfulness training. We know everyone who's a therapist in this room knows the power of mindfulness training and it's time for us to bring that into the bedroom. So she did mindfulness training with women. She wrote a book called Mm, mm, mm. Sorry, Lori. Um, if you Google Lori Brado's book, it's on the, in my book, you can see the listing for her book. Something about how to have great sex. Anyways, it's a beautiful book, basically translation of her research to the end user, basically about mindfulness skills and how helpful they are in the bedroom. It can bring up the awareness that we're, we're doing that thing where we criticize our body, or we're doing that thing where we think about all the things we didn't get accomplished in the day, or we're doing that thing where we're so focused on our partner that we aren't focused on ourselves. So it brings up the ability to notice the thoughts we're having and then redirect to sensation, redirect to the present moment. And in her research, she found that when she teaches women meditation skills and brings, bring them, they bring them into the bedroom, she found increases in sexual desire arousal, lubrication, and orgasm. Powerful, right? That was, a, that was a powerful intervention. One of the things that confronts is the idea that, I think we, ha we live in this highly romanticized world where it's like, if I have to manage my mind while I'm making love, it must mean there's something wrong with me or you or us. Versus just, yes, managing our mind, noticing our mind, that practice not just getting totally lost in the moment and so blown away that nothing else exists. That practice of bringing our minds back, working with our minds, is, is a practice. And it's important and it's necessary and, and we deserve nothing less. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to move through. So um, self-compassion, obviously in the bedroom, self-compassion and mindfulness are sort of hand in hand. Emotional, the only thing I'm going to say here is I think a helpful practice, especially for those of us who are in the dating world, who are single or who are single again, coming out of intimate relationship, this practice of relating to our emotions as data. And so that's very simple sort of functional behavior analysis of how did you feel before, how do you feel during, and how do you feel after. Inviting our clients or ourselves to track our emotions, using, relating to our emotions as data. And then using that data to understand what do I need more of, what do I need less of, and what did I just learn about my sexual boundaries by using emotions, understanding the value in our emotions. Okay, with the relational realm, I've been hinting at the relational realm all day. What we're mostly focusing on here is talking to our partners. And so in the book, there's a lot, I have a, this whole bag of tricks that I've collected from all the couples I've known over the years of what they have done to scaffold the difficult conversations. My favorite one, I will just tell you briefly, is a couple who uses puppets to have conversations about sex. Because sitting face to face and being like, I would love more oral sex. Well, I, you know, it was just, it was a lot for them. They scaffold it with puppets and the puppets could say things and make requests that they couldn't make and ask for. And I love this idea of creating some, you know, having some distance to create closeness. It's a beautiful, clever workaround. 
And then the frame, again and again and again, has to be that every sexual problem is a couple problem. There's no such thing as you want sex too much. There's no such thing as you don't want sex enough. There's no such thing. That locks us into the shame-blame stance, right? Far more intimacy producing is the two of us shoulder to shoulder looking at what supports each of us. What supports the erotic evolution of each of us? What do each of us need? What support? When do we feel most supported? It's a far more interesting conversation. And then spiritual, this was a challenging chapter to write because I, nothing I do is, I, I really try to eschew the idea of like sort of top-down rules, um, what's best. But what I do in this chapter is invite people to look at the relationship between their spirituality and their sexuality. And for some, I had a gal on my team who grew up in China where there was, she had no religious foundation. And so this chapter was, you know, like neither here nor there for her. But the gal next to her had gone to 12 years of Catholic school. And for her, it was, this was a really confronting chapter for her to be part of and to notice the triangle that lives in her of God, sex, and shame. And so we write about, um, in this chapter, I write about spiritual renovation. What are the ways in which we can honor the beautiful lessons and teaching and foundation and family of our background while also perhaps expanding in a way that can support our sexuality? And there's a whole, you know, when we look at the intersection of spirituality and sexuality, there are entire, like the whole idea of tantra, right, is a whole practice of infusing sexuality with spirituality. So those are the kinds of, questions um, that are in that, that chapter. We did it. Okay, so I, um, that's the end of this presentation, and I am really eager to, to hear from you what's resonating, what questions do you have. So thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you. This was so informative. Um, I'm, try I'm still trying to think of how exactly I want to phrase this, but since no one else is jumping up to ask questions, um, I'm curious to know what you have to say about, like, the terminology that I would use, I guess, from my theoretical orientation would be erotic transference um, and that sort of thing that may come up as a clinician, um, especially as an emerging clinician who has been really working on a lot of aspects of my sexuality with my own therapist. Um, and in my life, uh, it's something that I've been trying to pay attention to, but I have, it's that um, titillation versus taboo thing really resonated with me in this, uh, when thinking about this uh, specific topic. So I'd love to know what you have to say about that. Beautiful. So this idea of erotic transference is, is your own willingness to work as a clinician to what, what's coming up for you around attraction to a client, fantasies about a client, absolutely. And there is you know, one of the things I love, so in the last year, Justin Lee Miller published a book called Tell Me What You Want about sexual fantasy. And he interviewed, he has survey data from almost 5,000 Americans. And his top, the, the high end, the high line finding he found is that 95% of us have sexual fantasies. So it is, sexual fantasy is simply an erotically charged thought or narrative or storyline. So there is a way in which I think the first thing I would want to encourage a clinician who's dealing with an erotic transference is just to really meet it with curiosity. I think what's at, what's at risk for us around erotic, erotic stuff coming up, especially in the therapy office, is this idea of taboo. Like, oh my god, what's wrong with me that I'm having this thought about this client? We know darn well if that's the response of like, I'm bad, this shouldn't happen, if you shut it down, there is nothing the erotic loves more than a little bit more challenge, right? The erotic is sort of like supercharged by the idea of transgression, taboo, we can't possibly, oh no, we'll get in so much trouble. All that stuff just fuels and intensifies erotic energy. So the first challenge is to meet it with curiosity. Huh. And to remember to the depths of your bones that, that it is manageable. It's a thought. It is a manageable thought. It can be worked with. And the thing we always do with any kind of transference is we've got to sort of suss out the degree to which it's my stuff, the degree to which it's my client's stuff. So it may, so I be, there's, an, you know, there's two entire histories here, right? There's your history and there's your client's history. It may be that with this client, that transference is getting charged up because there's something really important your client wants to and needs to work on around their sexuality that they don't know how to bring up. 
it's sort of a reminder for all of us in our work to just model that sex can be talked about in our offices and to make sure that we we don't need to go and become an ASEC certified sex therapist in order to hold space in our offices for conversations about sex. We do need to make sure that we are educating ourselves and working on ourselves so that we aren't being reactive, yucking our clients yum, as sex therapists like to say. But it may be that part of what you're holding is your client sort of like tip of their tongue, there's something they want to work on, they don't know how to bring it in. It may be, you know, the erotic is also the, it's, it is, you know, Esther Perala would say it's aliveness. It's aliveness. So it may be a reflection of just how deeply present you are with this client, how much you love this client. And so the energy of the erotic says nothing about what we do with it. It's vastly, vastly different, right? It's what I hate so much about, well, one of the things I hate so much about dress code rules in schools is like the, you know, the tank top strap has to be this wide. And it's what gets missed there is the chance for a boy or whoever is looking at the, the, the bare shoulder, having the chance to notice the shoulder, feel the rush, and ground it. Grounding the rush is an essential skill. You know, we, we bring all of us into all of our workplaces, and we have to learn, I want us to, to learn, have tools for how we feel that rush, and then come back to the job in front of me. Who else? Yes, sir. Uh, I was curious more about the process of writing the book because you mentioned a little bit about the groups or the different people who worked on it. So I just wanted to hear more about how it was made. Yeah, this, um, I feel like I chose to write Loving Bravely, that it was like I was pushing something up a hill, not in a bad way, but just that I was the, I was the motivator behind it. This book, I had the experience that I've heard, art, I, I never have associated myself, I don't feel like a creative person or an artist, certainly, but I've heard artists talk about you know, that it's the book comes through you or the painting comes through you. And I, I just had no, no relation to that experience until this book. This book became, it literally became harder to resist the urge to write the book than to just open my laptop and start to work on it. So that was really the process was allow, like basically allowing it to come through. And I love, you know, as a, as a professor, I love to make, um, like I love to make a syllabus, figure out how you chunk it, you know, content and sequence it and which ideas hang together. And so I love that. So I can really go to town on um, sort of creating a table of contents, figuring out how to sequence it. So there was that really left brain part of structuring it. And then there was the right brain part of just like allowing. And I used, it's interesting, I haven't said this out loud yet in the space. I use a lot of music with this book. Like I would, if I had a writing day, I would first um, like turn on some like really loud Beyonce and I would dance a bit and I would like get myself into a space to go connect with this book because it was just, it was, it was, I wanted to be able to honor like the, the sort of power of what's possible when we start to make space for talking about female sexuality. Um, so that was a really different part of the process as well. But my team, right, I had this team of graduate students and undergrads and we would meet and they would do different tasks, you know, research this article or they would read and edit a chapter and um, that's a huge blessing I have. You can stay seated. Alexandra, great job, I enjoyed it. Um, of the domains of sexual self-awareness, are there ones that have been more difficult for you in working with couples and how, um, or maybe ones that have been more uh, satisfying or easier to address? I think that, I think a big one is that developmental one, talking about sexual desire. I think that concept of moving from thinking about sexual desire as only spontaneous, we only have sex when we feel horny, to understanding that desire needs to be cultivated, that's a really big, that's a simple thing that can pack a big punch. Because what happens is if we think that sex is only about, about feeling horny, it just makes so much space for stories to attach. Why don't you want me? Why don't I want it? What's wrong with me? I used to want it, now I don't want it. Like that's, it's normative. I had a client say to me, this was a client who was in the dating world, she had just gone through a breakup and the story of the breakup was, we were together and like the sex was great and then after a little while, like the sex went bad. And so you know how like when the sex goes bad, the relationship goes bad, so I broke up with him. That was the story and it was, 
it was her deep truth, of course, because it may be, you know, and there, there may have been more, there certainly was more to the story, but just the fact that there was able to be a narrative that said that when, when I began to notice shifts around my desire, which is what she was saying, I didn't want him the way I wanted him in the beginning. I didn't want to jump his bones as frequently in the beginning. My desire shifted. She attached to that a story of we are wrong for each other versus being able to, ref if I had been her therapist at the time, I, I would have reflected back to her some stuff around cultivating desire. That Actually, what, what the research shows is that as we settle in to sexual monogamy, especially women, what the research shows is that women shift much more quickly out of spontaneous desire than men do. So what, what she was describing was a very normative process in which she would, as a next step, if she wanted to stay in this relationship, she would need to kind of work with her accelerator and her brake and figure out what turns her on. How does she turn herself on? What helps her spark up around that? But what happened without knowing that was she felt the shift in her desire and she attached a story, because we do, because we're meaning-making creatures, and her story was, we're wrong for each other. I'm sure, there's more than that, I'm sure, that broke them up, but, that, but that's unfortunate. So that ends up being a thing that can kind of pack a lot of punch. Okay, right here. Hi, Alexandra. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have, um, I'm just curious, with our youngest, with our children, like, there's this fear in me, and I think in other parents, of doing it wrong, particularly when we want a healthy start to a sexual journey. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice on what age to start talking, I'm thinking girls, I have girls, talking to our girls, and what, if you could, like, miraculously have everyone talk about a few things to our girls, what would those things be that you would be emphasizing? Yeah, and what to avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, I really appreciate you naming this piece about fear of doing it wrong, because I think that that is very, very, very common to feel afraid of doing it wrong. And what happens when we get afraid of doing something wrong, we just clam up, right? We just go silent. Um, staring at me. And then, and that's, and that can be a real inhibitor. And so I think one thing would just, the first thing would just be to say, I don't, listen, there is no place in the parenting manual about how to do this the right way. And I'm going to fumble, and I'm going to blush, and I'm going to stammer, but I really, really want you to, I, I want you to understand your body. I want you to understand your boundaries. So one of the things we can start to do from little to little, like I've, um, I was just talking to somebody the other day, she's got a little baby, and she says to her baby, okay, sweet boy, I'm going to wipe your penis down now. And, you know, so she uses the, she, we use the actual words, right, saying penis, saying vulva. P.S., the vagina is just the opening, the vulva is the entire thing. So we do a, we have, don't, don't even oftentimes know the right names for things. So this is your vulva, using those words, normalizing that, that, that these parts of your body feel different to touch than other parts of your body. I think what we get scared of is if our kids know these parts feel good, they're going to use them with other people. That, that doesn't, we, we do a kind of false conflation there that other cultures don't, don't do. To me, the, the, the interesting case study is Northern Europe, like Amsterdam and the Netherlands. They, they start sex education at age five, and there it's about naming body parts, um, it's about boundaries, so that I've seen families doing this more and more now than even five years ago. When you go to Thanksgiving, you, your kids have a choice. You can do a high five, you can do a handshake, you can do a hug if you want, but teaching that bodily autonomy, that you are in charge of the kind of touch that you receive. Just because Uncle Fred wants to hug you, you don't have to hug Uncle Fred. You are under zero obligation to ever hug anybody. And te that little moment of check-in, like what do you want to do? Do you, are you up, what, are you, what are you wanting as a connection? Asking our kids, can I hug you? Just that little thing kind of teaches that there's a boundary around them. Um, I think one of the things we do with our, what I, what, um, around our boys, because the predominant narrative is that male sexuality is out of control, inherently predatory and dangerous, a lot of times our messages to boys are don't. Be, just be careful, make sure you respect her, da da da, da. Certainly important messages, but what, what's not in there is all of the emotion and vulnerability around sex. The, um, when I was with the men the other night at the um, event on campus, one of the guys was sharing with me that he had been in a relationship when he was a freshman in college, and he 
really struggled in the relationship. He had his walls up. He did not know how to name a feeling. He um, was very focused on sex with performance. And then now he's done three years of this work of doing um, violence prevention training and his own kind of masculine recovery. In their community, they call it, rather than toxic masculinity, they call it restrictive masculinity. He's been working on getting in touch with his vulnerability, realizing how much vulnerability exists in sex for him. And now he's in a new relationship and he's so proud of the degree to which he can care for his partner, talk about his internal experience, and he says, I would 100% not be here had I not done this men's work. It's a beautiful thing. So that all the ways in which we deconstruct those gendered narratives that keep each sex from the other half of the human experience, as Peggy Ornstein says, girls are disconnected from their bodies and boys are disconnected from their hearts. The more we can help them just feel that access, the better. And then I think we do need to be working on like limiting access to pornography as best we can, which is hard because our kids are going to always be one step ahead of us. But the conversation around pornography, I think, needs to be grounded in you deserve a sexuality that, that comes from within you, that's an expression within you. When you watch pornography, you're taking in a lot of very strong images that are not realistic. We don't have to be anti-porn to say that porn is not a great sex educator. As somebody said, Learning about sex from porn is like learning how to drive by watching The Fast and the Furious. <laughs> so that I think we can give our kids that message. I don't want you watching porn because you deserve to learn about sex with your first partner, where the two of you figure it out together. I was giving a talk um, at the Coast Guard Academy and one of sexual violence, there was a sexual violence prevention conference, and I was there talking about healthy relationships. And a hand went up, and a cadet said he was making the case to me that um, the fact that the campus, you know, they had their Wi-Fi set up so you can't access pornography while you're on campus. And he was making the case that he thinks that puts people at greater risk. If, I don't, if, we, if you don't give the cadets pornography, then actual people are more at risk. I was like, I'm going to just push back a bit to the extent that I think it's actually really fascinating that you have a chance at this point in your life while you are really starting to understand your sexuality, that you will have to masturbate with your imagination. What a beautiful, like, 1990s gift that you have. <laughs> when I was telling a story, somebody was like, you should make like a hashtag. It's like, masturbate like it's 1987. <laughs> you have to just follow your imagination to all the freaky wild places that it would go. And that, that kind of just, he was like, all right, OK. <laughs> it's a lot less fun after that. Alexander yeah. right here. Okay, so this is piggybacking on what you just said. Um, I'm a provider at the health center at Evanston High School, and we have programs on healthy relationships. We have programs on sex education, but we have no formal porn literacy program. And what we're noticing is that these kids are exposed very young. It's like when they first get their phone in junior high and they're on a bus and sa someone says, Look at this. And we've had multiple students confide to us about porn addictions or the first time they actually have sex. That was nothing like what they expected. And it definitely reinforces gender stereotypes. And I'm just curious what you think about having, because they do exist, a formal porn literacy program. And, and at what age should we have it? Right. Yeah, I mean, you're, you have your finger right on it. That's a, I completely agree with what you're saying, that that is sex education ends up being incomplete. At this moment in time, it's incomplete without porn literacy, 100%. We, that's a reckoning that parents need to go through, is that when, when you give your child a phone, you're giving them access to pornography, even if you try to set filters. Um, so, that's, so that is definitely a reality of what we're living in. Um, Emily Rothman at the Kinsey Institute is the one who's creating, the, um, uh, she's created a porn, porn literacy program. It was written about in the New York Times article that came out a couple of years ago called What Our Teens Are Learning From Porn. So if you Google that article, there's quite a bit of detail in what, around what they're doing with that porn literacy curriculum. It's fascinating. It's basically critical thinking. You know, it's critical thinking about what you're seeing. Um, one piece of it is about helping people tap into the sort of moral compass around what it means to consume something that wasn't ethically produced. So they share information about how the, how the performers are paid, how poorly they're paid, how much their work is pirated, and then 
Um, they aren't fully, you know, sort of um, reimbursed or given royalties for the work that they've done. And so sort of getting into sort of the gnarliness of the industry, which, is, which has transformed in the last decade with the advent of, of smartphones. Um, so there's a part of it that's about being like about ethical and part that's psychological. It's a really sharp program. And so that's, that's where I would like all of us to go around that. The problem is the pendulum is swinging back the other way around sex education in general. We are actually moving back towards the days of abstinence only sex education around federal dollars. School, you know, school systems are, are tend to be rather um, limited by sort of federal monies and the curricula you're allowed to use. I've heard stories about, about that as well. Um, and it's tied, you know, the sex education is really, really tied to the political climate, unfortunately. So it's a strange thing that we've kind of co-opted sex education and made it into a political issue, but that can oftentimes limit. And it puts a ton of responsibility on families that I really, I'm aware that that's a, a burden and responsibility and on your departments like yours that are really trying to do, trying to do the right thing. Alex, right here. Can you see me? You could stand up. Uh, hi, thank you again for the presentation. Um, my question actually, I'm a clinician uh, and I'm working with emerging adults, um, which is funny because I do look like a teenager and I understand that. But my question actually was um, more because I'm trying to educate a lot of these college students about masturbation and how that has been very, I mean, that's not taught by families most often times and wondering if there's any kind of, um, not also for the parents, because I know there are parents in here as well, um, on how we can better speak openly about masturbation with obviously male and female and you know trans or whatever, and how we can actually kind of make it a conducive environment for them to be comfortable to understand that masturbation is actually a really great way of exploring our sexuality. So um, yeah. Especially, um, especially for those with, with a vulva. Um, masturbation is, is essential. There's, you, you will not find a sex therapist out there who doesn't recommend that as like a frontline intervention if there's a, a, some, a, a client with a vulva who is experiencing sexual desire problems. The first line thing they're going to do is talk about masturbation. So it is really normalized. And so I think we can normalize. I, I would invite you to consider what constraint, if, you are, if your parent hat goes on and you imagine a conversation with a 13-year-old uh, about masturbation, what comes up for you? What are the beliefs that that might be leading to you wanting to go silent about that? What are the fears? What are the stories? I know sometimes it's like, I want to like look up and down the block and be like, are you doing, are you having the talk? Because if we're all going to have the talk, I'm okay. But I don't want to be the one parent who's like telling my, my daughter, you know, so I think it can feel like, I, am I the only one? Are we all doing this? And so I, so I, I think it's a really important conversation because the more, I think the, the, the counterbalance is the more especially a girl or someone with a vulva feels entitled to pleasure, the easier she's going to, if, the easier it's going to be for her to say, whoa, hang on, I am not interested in that. And we want her to be able to do that, right? Somebody asked a question before, like, my daughter is going to the school, she's straight, all the boys are watching hardcore porn. And they're all, you know, like, what if they want, you know, anal and choking and all these things that are very, very normalized in porn. Okay, so there's what if he wants it, and then there's what if she is like, I am, what are you talking about? That ability to be like, what are you talking about? We're not going anywhere until and unless you start to talk to me about what's gonna feel good for me. Because I actually know, I actually know, I have some thoughts and I know where my boundaries are. Because my mom, even though she was blushing and had to have a glass of wine before we talked about it, <laughs> told me it's okay to masturbate. And she told me a story, I couldn't even believe it, about her own masturbation when she was in high school. And I was like, mom, don't tell me this story. But then it actually helped me. And it helped me understand about what I deserve, where my boundaries are, what I get to do. I just saw a study, and this is really dicey because it, I don't, there's a way we need to talk about it that is not victim blaming, but when you look at women on campus who have been sexually assaulted, there is a stronger, not a higher incidence of women on campus who have been sexually assaulted who had abstinence only, sex education, and a lower incidence of sexual assault for women who received comprehensive sex education that included communication about sex. 
If we want to reduce sexual assault on campus, that's a piece of it, which does not mean she's responsible for what happened to her, but it does mean that one of the ways we protect her is by teaching her about her voice, about her body, about the fact that her sexuality lives inside of her. I think there's a, an interesting fear around if women know how to masturbate, do we render men <laughs> unnecessary? <laughs> that's part of it. <laughs> so I think that's maybe a part of the constraint. It's like if, if women really understand that they can bring themselves pleasure, do we still need men? I think yes, <laughs> absolutely. There's plenty of room for relationality across gender difference and amplification of pleasure, all that kind of stuff. But so, so it's not an, an either or, but there's a lot of fear and shame around masturbation that we were all taught that if we're willing to kind of transform that, we have a chance to offer something different to the, the next group of girls. Okay, last question, we're at almost 10.30. Hi, you talk about your stuff plus our, plus your stuff plus my stuff equals our stuff, especially when it comes to sex. And certainly that's always true, but oftentimes it does seem like it's more one person's stuff than another's. Any thoughts on how you handle that tricky balance with couples? Yep. So one example might be around, um, there's a, a one partner has sexual trauma and the other partner does not. So there might be quite a bit of constraint around the, the partner who's a trauma survivor, right? So that, so there is, um, there is their partner A is a, is a survivor of trauma, so there's a heavy, um, load there, a heavy constraint around, sexual, around sex based on that. Absolutely. So a piece of partner A's work is going to be around healing trauma and attending to how that partner gets to reclaim. What we know about sexual trauma is it doesn't, it doesn't um, break connection to the erotic, it, but it disconnects it, right? So the process of reconnection to body is essential. And the partner B stuff is what is it like? What is it like to be partnered with somebody who's a survivor of trauma? And does that partner have space to name the grief, the rage, the sadness that this doesn't get to be an easy area for us? And can we make space for partner B to learn what it looks like to be an ally? What does that look like? How does, and can A and B talk about that? Can B say, if you start to dissociate while we're starting to get intimate, tell me, flag me, let's, ha let's have a word. Let's figure out how are we gonna stop and reset and figure this out together. So there is an example of sort of like the partner A stuff is heavy around this conversation, but B has a piece too. What does it bring up for them? What is it like for them? And what can they do to kind of support healing? Partner B cannot do partner A's healing work for them, but they can certainly be an ally and a source of um, of sexual healing. <laughs>